Um, next up, we have project, project presentation two. Uh, I think that the presenters made sure that the name of this is incredibly difficult for anyone, not them, to pronounce. So I will do my best. The title of their presentation is FTZ Mediated Brownian Ratcheting Regulates Spatial Temporal Organization of Bacterial Cell Wall Synthesis. I need to breathe now. Um, and that will be presented by Jie Zhao and Jian Lu of John Hopkins University. And really quickly, if I can just take you to Kai Storm, um, remember in this bottom right hand corner, if you have any questions, click that. Uh, plus and add your questions. And if GA and Jian Lu are ready, um, you can take it over from here. Thank you. Thank you, Malaki. Uh, Jian and I discussed, so I will take the first half and the Jian will follow uh, when the second half. So let me start sharing my screen. Can you all see the screen well? Very good. Yes. All Thank right. You. Okay, so I'm going to start. So th this is really a collaborative project between me as an experimentalist and Jen, the uh, theoretician, the modeler. So this is the perfect project presentation for us. Um, so let me first start about telling you a little about back to yourself. Oh, actually, let me first actually get my acknowledgement out of the way because we're going to do this half and a half. So this work is really done through collaboration with Jen Liu, who did all the modeling for us, and also with Keith DeBoer, who is a geneticist who worked with us with all those bacteria uh, genetic background. And this is really also done by collaborative efforts uh, among my students, Josh, uh, uh, graduate students and the two very talented postdocs, Xin Xin and Jason, that I labeled their name over there. So let me start by um, telling you a little about the um, anatomy of a bacterial cell, because we have such a broad um, spectrum of audience. So bacterial cells, you know, with first simple, it really has this cell ethanol that's encompass all the nucleus and the cytoplasm together. And my talk today really going to focus on the cell envelope. So the cell envelope for uh, grand negative bacteria, there are three layers. So there is an outer membrane and there is an inner membrane. Now between those two membranes, so there is a one gigantic molecule called the cell wall. So the cell wall is really made um, of those uh, long polymers of uh, peptoglycan strength that are cross-linked together. Seeing we it's a meshed network, it's really one connected uh, gigantic uh, molecule. Now those uh, cross-linked peptoglycan strands, they're really long uh, polymerized sugars. So basically you have two sugars and repeated units just being polymerized together by specific polymerization uh, polymerase. You know, which you can think about this more like a DNA strand. You have this repeated units being polymerized and elongated by DNA polymerase. But here we have the peptoglycan polymerase. And to strengthen the mechanical property of this um, mesh network, they're also crossing together. Uh, so those two peptide uh, stems from those disugar units. And there are specific enzymes for this. So the cell wall is a very important uh, molecule for bacterial cells. Um, they protect the cells from lysis and then maintain the cell shape. And you have you 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 all probably know that cell wall is the first target uh, by the first uh, antibiotic that human made, uh, beta lactam, the penicillin, who saved millions of people's life during World War uh, II. Um, that's really targeting the cell wall synthesis enzymes because if you don't have this cell wall over there, uh, the cell wall lies and dies. So here I'm showing you one uh, EM image of a cyclus, which is just simply the isolated cell wall. You can actually dissolve and you know dissolve all the cell membrane, you know chop up all the DNA, the protein. You end up with this one empty shell. So this shell actually maintains the cell shape and provides this mechanical stability. So it's very important for a cell to maintain the integrity of the cell wall. But then at the same time, the cell need to grow and divide. So you have to go through this continuous remodeling of the cell wall. So the cell grows by continuous uh, by elongation, 
which you have the degradation of the old glycan strand, uh, which is shown here in orange, but you also have insertion of the new glycan strand. So the degradation and the insertion has to be coordinated in time and in space. During cell uh, division, you would have this constriction phase where that the shape of the cell will be changed. But again, this is done by the coordinated uh, degradation or splitting of the old glycan strand and also the synthesis of the new glycan strand. So all of those things has really to be uh, uh, coordinated both in time and in space. So what are the proteins um, and how are those proteins are uh, organized or uh, orchestrated together to um, maintain the integrity and the shape of the cell wall and also at the same time to divide the cell wall. Like, you know, you have this rigid structure when you're splitting it, you want to make sure you're also inserting new strands so that you're not going to end up with a, uh, with a lesion in the cell wall, which could compromise the cell survival. So through so lots of study from many groups uh, in the past uh, uh, 50 years or so, people know that there is a one protein called FTSZ, which is a cytoskeleton protein. It's a tubular homologue. It's a, a GTPase. This protein absolutely play a very important role in cell division. So uh, here we labeled FTSZ with the GAP fluorescent protein. You can clearly see that this protein actually come to the middle of the cell. I'm going to play one more time. And when cell about to divide, they quickly shrink and go to the two daughter cells, so middle cell, to direct the next one to cell division. So if I put all those things in a cartoon, you can see FTSZ scatter inside the cell, then come to the middle, form a ring-like structure, then gradually that ring diminishing diameter and separate these two cells. I mean, it's an easy cartoon to show, but how this protein actually coordinates all those other enzymes, it took a lot of time for people to figure out. And I think we just um, managed to make some uh, uh, progress in this, uh, in this process. So let me give you a little short introduction of what FTSZ and this whole division, you know, collection of proteins do for cell division. So FTSZ can polymerize uh, along the inner membrane and uh, that is tethered to the membrane by two anchoring protein, it's A and ZK. And this is, um, this is where you see this, you know, very smooth uh, cell ring, uh, ring structure in the middle of the cell. And this is called the assembly of the Z-ring. Once the Z-ring assembles in the middle of the cell, it will recruit an array of more than 30 proteins in coli to come to the middle of the cell. We call it, this is the maturation of the whole division or the septal ring. And all of those uh, proteins, many of them are essential. Many of them are also involved in cell wall uh, synthesis and remodeling. Now you see that you have this FTSZ and form a scaffold and recruit all the other enzymes and regulators, modelers come over to remodel the cell wall to con uh, conduct successful cell wall constriction. But how does FTSZ do this? We know it's absolutely essential. If you don't have FTSZ, cell wall die will never divide. And you can intuitively think about that, you know, maybe FTC can just build a perfect scaffold, like what we would do when you want to build a beautiful dome for a cathedral uh, church. Uh, you, you build this perfect, you know, everything is in the right angle, right place and very stable. Uh, uh, then you can build the cell wall or the cell pole on top of that. But turns out that recent studies, including our own, shown that FTSZ direct cell division or cell wall constriction or the new cell pole formation through a very dynamic mechanism. This is scaffold is very dynamic. It's not uh, static. And that dynamics actually turn out to be very important for the function. So how did we discover this? Um, this it was kind of a serendipitous. So at that time, uh, my postdoc Xin Xin just came to our lab. And at that time, we saw something very funny. So we labeled FTSC with a fluorescent protein. So you can see that it's really formed in the middle of the cell and form a ring structure. And we used a turf so that we only watch one tiny uh, button of the, of the cell. Now, if you watch this thing, you, you can see that this FTSC cluster appears to be moving in the middle of the cell continuously and directionally. I will play it one more time. You can clearly see, even though in the resolution is not the greatest, you can clearly see the movement. Now, if we draw a line across the middle of the cell and project over time, that is called a chymograph. You can clearly see the intensity of labeled FTCZ polymers 
and it has this zigzag motion, which means that it's moving across the middle of the cell directionally. Later on, we had a better resolution. This is done by super resolution imaging, and we can look at the uh, cell uh, at the cross section. You can clearly see that this intensity is moving directionally, and almost every single cell is showing this movement. We know this is some type of protein dynamics, uh, polymer dynamics, so that we can actually measure the speed at the leading edge. We can also measure the speed at the trailing edge, and we can plot the speed uh, of both edges versus the GTPS activity of bacteria. We did a couple of GTPS Newton. Now we saw that this speed is really correlated with the GTPS activity. The higher the GTP hydrolysis rate is, the faster the speed is. And most importantly, you notice that on average, the speed of the leading edge and also the trailing edge are actually identical. So that's a very intriguing dynamics. But then at the same time, we also know FTSZ monomers in those polymers, they are completely stationary. We did single molecule tracking. We tracked the individual FTSZ monomers in those polymers, and across the time uh, of 10, 15 seconds, they are completely stationary. So how could you have completely stationary monomers generate a directional movement at an ensemble level? This turned out to be a very interesting polymer dynamics called trad meaning. So the trad meaning polymers move by continuous polarization at the front shown here, and also continuous depolarization at the end. So as such, that if I label one unit in the middle in yellow, you see it doesn't move, but because you have a continuous polarization at the front, continuous depolarization at the end, now as a result that this monomers does not move, but this polymer appear to be moving directionally. And the one feature of trad meaning, of course, is that the leading edge polarization rate has to, on average, equal to the speed of the depolarization at the trailing edge, so that you end up with a steady state. Otherwise, your polymer is going to continuously grow or continuously shrink. Okay. So this is a very interesting dynamics. And when we discovered that uh, in 2017, almost simultaneously, this also been discovered in all other bacteria uh, species that people have uh, studied so far. Of course, it has also been shown in vitro. So we know that this is a very universal phenomenon in all those bacteria cells because FTC is highly conserved. We also know that this is a only related to FTSZ's GTP hydrolysis activity. We did all other modification of the regulators, assembling time, you know, everything, expression level, etc. Nothing changed the treadmill speed except for the GTP hydrolysis rate of uh, FTSC. So we know this is some intrinsic polymer dynamics. But then you thought that this is really cool, you know, this set of uh, cytoskeletal protein shows that it's a very interesting dynamic, but what is the function? You know, as an experimentalist or biology, you always ask, you know, there must be a purpose for this. Otherwise, the FTC is just simply burning all those GTP and doing this, you know, round and round, doing nothing. And my postdoc, Xinxin, came to me one day, so, you know, Jay, I think, you know, there is a purpose they are doing this. And his hypothesis is that because FTSZ has to be the scaffolding protein to localize to the middle cell to recruit all the other enzymes. So what's going to happen is that if FTSZ is moving continuously, then all those cell wall enzymes will come over, do a little synthesis over there, then move together with the FTSZ to another position and do the synthesis. And as a result, we we'll actually see continuously moving around each round about 100 seconds, but the whole cell constriction time is about 20 minutes in our uh, experiment. So there is a time scale separation by doing this continuously uh, moving around the middle of the cell at the septum. FTSC actually serve as a guide and the directional force to distribute all of those enzymes along the middle of the cell so that you end up with a very smooth and symmetric septum formation as I shown here in this uh, wild type uh, FTSC string. But at the same time, if you think about if FTSC doesn't move, um, GTPS activity has been uh, GTPS activity has been decreased. Then what's going to happen next is that FTSC will stay over here, 
and all the enzyme would only come over there and they stay over there, then you end up with a highly asymmetric synthesis receptor. For example, here on one side, you have deep constriction, but on the other side, you have very shallow constriction. So you know, when you make the cell work very asymmetric, then you have this abnormal receptor formation. So if this hypothesis is really true, then immediately you would think about the larger question that then this tridominant dynamics must modulate the spatial distribution and or the activity of those cell wall enzymes. So in other words, you know, because all those proteins are dependent on FTC to come to the middle, then we think that you know, maybe some of those enzymes should really show this directional movement that really being transported by FTC to different places of the septum. So we decided to look at two proteins that are very essential among you know, a very large array of proteins. Those two proteins are called FTSW and FTSI. This work is um, in collaboration with our um, uh, collaborator, Pete DeBoer, who is a bacteria uh, geneticist who really helped us with all those genetic manipulation of the strains. And also, of course, this is done by Xin Xin. So W, uh, FTSW is a, a polymerase. It elongates the uh, um, peptidoglycan strands. It's like a DNA polymer, just continuously add on subunit and elongate it. FTSI is the crosslinker. It's responsible for crosslinking all those uh, uh, peptide things together. Those two, based on our biochemical and genetic evidence, appear to uh, form a complex together, form a bifunctional synthesis complex. So always together. So we decided to look at those two because we thought, you know, those are involved in the synthesis and what their dynamics look like. And turn out exactly as what Xin Xin expected when we labeled single FTSI molecules and then we look at the dynamics across the septum. So on the left is the Z axis projections, it's the movie all together, project together. On the Y, uh, on those three panels, there are kind of graph, which draw a line across the middle cell and watch how this molecule is moving across time. You can clearly see it is moving across the septum. And the moving, you can clearly see this one single FTSI molecule moving across the septum. And this is another example, this one single FTSI molecule moving across. And most interestingly, yeah. that in FTSZ GTPS mutant, where FTSZ moves much more slowly because you know the traveling <laughs> dynamics is much slower. Now you can see in the FTSI molecule now start to become stationary. They just stay over there throughout the time course. And correspondingly, their Z axis projection, you see one clear dot compared to the wild type, they're actually moving across the septum. And if you tabulate the speed, FTSI's average moving speed almost linearly correlate with FTSZ's treadmill speed. So this, that's indicated that really the FTSZ's treadmill dynamics are driving the directional movement of the FTSI enzyme. And we saw exactly the same thing for FTSW. FTSW clearly moving across the septum. Those are just two simple examples. And again, FTSW also stopped in those TTPs mutant of FTSZ. So now we know that uh, the treadmilling dynamics of FTSC really drive the directional movement of those enzymes. But here I, I will give you this one question and hopefully Jane will help to answer. We know FTSC monomers, they're stationary in the cytoplasm. How does that dynamics transmit into the paraplasm into the directional movement of FTSW? So this question is really answered by the collaboration uh, with Jane uh, and uh, uh, with my uh, graduate student, Josh. So Jen will give you the answer, uh, or at least what we think the right answer for this question. But before I, uh, I go over there, I want to show you one actual kink. Well, we found out actually FTSW, this enzyme, shows directional motion of different speed. So here you can clearly see on the chemo graph, it actually has transitions. If we unwrap the cell, get the trajectory, you can see some molecule just continuously very processed moving at a certain speed, but some molecule move at a very slow speed then very fast speed, three nanometer, then all of a sudden go to 25 nanometer, then come back to eight nanometer, also change the direction. 
Now, if we compile all those speed distribution and compare that with FTSZ's speed distribution, you can clearly see FTSW's speed distribution is much wider than FTSZ. FTC has an average speed of about 28 nanometers. FTCW can be decomposed into two populations. One has a similar speed, about 28 nanometer per second, but another population we call the slow population is only about eight nanometer per second. And most interestingly, we found out that this fast moving population of FTCW correspond to FTCZ's treadmilling speed but this is slow moving population does not. So here we decompose the total speed of FTCW into two population. In blue or cyan is the fast speed, the yellow or uh, the or orange and the red are the slow moving population. You can clearly see that this slow moving population does not, is not dependent on FTCZ's traveling speed. So, but then the question is that, what is this slow moving population uh, do? So we found out that this slow moving population of FTCW actually respond to the synthesis activity of the cell wall. Here we use a set of mutants from top to bottom. We have a loss of function mutation of drug inhibition. You can see that the synthesis activity gradually slows down. But then you can see that this red population or the slow moving population also decrease, but this blue population or fast moving population increase. So in a way you have a modulation, when you inhibit uh, certain peptoglycan synthesis activity, you decrease this slow moving population. Conversely, if we increase the synthesis activity, now we saw also increase of the slow moving population that showing that enhancing activity, you also enhance this slow moving population. The average shows the exactly the same thing. When you diminish the synthesis activity, you see a significant increase of the speed and because of the population shift to this fast moving population. We can also modulate the uh, substrate concentration, which we call the cell wall synthesis uh, precursor level. When you diminish the precursor level inside the cell, you see that the enzyme that's responsible for the synthesis population for the slow population re, uh, decrease, but this uh, um, fast moving population increase. And most interestingly, we can also increase the precursor level so that you can actually see that now this slow moving population or in our sense, the active population also increase and the fast population get completely diminished. And most interesting to us, if you draw a line about the average speed, you can clearly see that the average speed of this slow moving population or the active enzyme population also increase when you have a much higher level of substrate, which indicates that the speed of the slow moving population may actually reflect the in vivo glycan chain polymerization rate. So imagine if you're watching a DNA polymer set where you can actually watch how fast that the DNA polymerase molecule is moving inside the living cell and that speed tell you how fast it's elongating the DNA. So this is very exciting for us because now we have a way to read out all those enzymatic activity and ask questions about how those are regulated by many other regulators. So with that, I will stop here, just give you this a very quick um, two track model we came up with. We think that usually uh, th those enzymes are basically carried by FTSZ on this Z track. They're not active, but then we have other proteins on the uh, septum synthesis um, track we called uh, SPG track. One protein called FTSN, I didn't have time to tell you the study, but this protein we found exclusively coupled to active synthesis. And there are attraction force going on when FTSW and I goes to the SPG track, they being activated, then you start moving at a slower speed, which you just reflect the polarization rate inside the cell. And, 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 and uh, um, by this uh, spatially uh, switching back and forth between those two tracks, Z track versus SPG track, you also couple the enzymatic uh, uh, activation, um, regulation of the enzymatic activity. Uh, by those all those uh, different components of the cell wall uh, division together. So you, you have the coupling of the spatial distribution and also the enzymatic uh, um, activity. So, but then again, the question, if you remember, 
I showed before that um, the cell wall synthesis enzymes activities are actually independent of FTSZ's trapamine dynamics. But we also show FTSZ, you know, faster trapamine, slower trapamine cause uh, different septum morphology, which means that they actually influence the cell wall synthesis. How could that, re how could those two results reconcile with each other? So that's the question I'm going to ask Jen to help uh, answer in the next uh, talk. Um. All right. So, um, um, I think we can get started. Looks great. Um, all right. So, um, thank you for the uh, invitation and thank you, you all for coming. And I also thank GF for uh, introducing this wonderful topic and for the great uh, collaboration. And um, now I'm going to present the modeling side of the story. Um, so uh, just a recap, um, from GS talk, we have heard that FTSZ is the central organizer for the assembly of the proteins that are essential for the subtle cell wall synthesis and for bacterial cell division. And the FTSZ polymers undergoes uh, treatment while the individual FTSZ molecules uh, remain uh, stationary. And the uh, essential uh, SPG Synthesis uh, such as FTSI and W uh, moves directionally by coupling to the FTSC trip balance. Now, the questions are uh, how does the, the uh, stationary FTSC molecules drive a directional motilities of SPG synthesis? And uh, uh, how does the FTSC trip milling control the SPG? Uh, synthesis activities, and how do the FTSZ treatment and the subtle cell wall synthesis work together in, in driving the cell uh, divisions? So to address the first question, uh, we hypothesize that the uh, FTSZ treatment could drive the directed motility where a brand new ratchet mines. The idea in, in, is that while the FTSI, uh, for example, can diffuse along the septum, it had the binding potential, or it had the binding affinity to the FTSZ molecules. The problem, it does not bind to the FTSZ directly, but through other molecules, uh, such as FTSA. Once bound, the FTSI will stuck in the binding, in the binding uh, potential. As the FTSZ polymer treatments, and the, the shrinking end of the polymer will, will introduce an a symmetry. Uh, since now, all the binding potentials are on the right-hand side of the FTSI. This will attract the FTSI to the next FTSZ subunit uh, in a row and rectify the diffusion of the FTSI into a persistent tracking of the FTSZ polymer and uh, the shrinking end. And for simplicity, our mathematical model is a one dimension. And when the periodic boundary conditions, we assume that the FTSC polymer will treat melt from the left to right. And the shrinking end and the growing ends of the polymer will change the position at the treatment speed of an uh, VZ. We describe the movements of FTSI by the Langevin dynamics uh, image the speed of the molecules is determined by the force balance between the whisk drag and the external driving force that uh, include the driving force from the binding uh, potential and the uh, random thermal forces. Here, the, um, the uh, whisk drag coefficient of FTSI is inversely proportional to the uh, intrinsic diffusion constant of FTSI. So the binding potential, um, uh, is for each of the FTSZ subunit, it's modeled as the harmonic potential when a short range uh, of five 
nanometer, uh, which is the same linear dimension of the FTX Z sub uh, unit. If the phase I is within the uh, binding range, then the driving force will be the restoring force from the harmonic potential, just like a elastic spring. Now, if the FTSI is out of the binding range, then, then the driving force will be zero and the FTSI will simply undergo free diffusion. And, and here's the uh, typical simulation trajectories. When the FTSI is initially bound to the shrinking end of FTSZ polymer, and here the magenta line and is the trajectories of the FTSZ shrinking end over time, and the blue line is the trajectory of the FTSI. Uh, in a zoom in view, uh, as you can see, the FTSI uh, will remain tethered at the, at the end of the FTSZ polymers until this uh, FTSZ subunit dissociate. And then the FTSI will undergo free diffusion around until it get captured by the next FTSC uh, sub uh, unit uh, in a row. As these um, as these episodes continues, the FTSI can basically attract the FTSC shrinking end for a while, resulting in the directed um, uh, motility. And however, this end tracking it will not persist forever. Uh, since the diffusion of the free FTSI is random. So when the FTSI diffuse away from the FTSI shrinking end, so the end tracking will terminate as shown here. Nevertheless, the, our simulation shows that when the FTSI uh, undergo persistent end tracking at directional speeds will tightly coupled when the uh, FTSI treatment speed consistent when the experiment. So here, um, uh, at a fixed treatment speed of 30 nanometer per second, we calculate uh, in our model the phase diagram of how the persistent untracking of FTSI and depends on its binding potential when FTS is Z and its diffusion constant of the free FTSI. At each parameter set, we, de we define the persistent untracking uh, if there is a more than 50% of the simulated the trajectory of the FTSI. This place the directed motility for more than five seconds. It's not a surprise that the persistent and tracking will uh, require sufficient binding uh, potentials. On the other hand, a unique aspect of branding ratcheting is that the resulting directed motility will hinges on the free diffusion of FTSI. So when the diffusion is too slow, the FTSI will keep up, will, uh, will cannot keep up the FTSZ uh, shrinking end. Now, on the other hand, if FTSI is too diffusive, then it cannot stay stable within the binding potential and hence cannot persistently untrack the FTSZ after all. Therefore, we predict that the uh, diffusion of FTSI cannot be too slow or too fast. And it, it, it should be in the range of 0.01 to 0.1 micron per second. Uh, uh, a micron square per second. And uh, indeed, um, our single molecule track experiment shows that the free diffusion of FTSI is around 0.03 to 0.04 a micron square per second. It is, and, and it is not only conserved across different bacteria, but is consistent with our model predictions. And this agreement uh, encourage us to use the model to make further per, uh, predictions. For example, the model predicts our very unique features of the persistent and tracking, while the upper limit of the duration of the and tracking decreases when the treatment speed, the corresponding um, persistent run length actually is by phase. It first increased and then decrease when treatment speed. Um, here, the FTSD, when the FTSD treatment goes very fast, it will become very difficult for the FTSI diffusion to keep up when the FTSD uh, uh, shrinking end. Now, even when this FTSI happen to untrack, and in this case, the run length will be uh, very short. This prediction is, is a distinctive of branding ratchet mechanism. So to test this prediction, uh, Josh uh, 
a graduate student from GS lab painstakingly carry out the micro hole experiments by trapping the E. coli cells uh, into the hole. Josh could have a perfect undone view of the uh, septum and can uh, track the motilities of FTSI or W faithfully uh, around the perimeter of the uh, septum. Here is the um, typical um, tra uh, trajectories from the experiment from which Josh can measure how the duration and run length of FTSI directional motion correlate when speed. And Indeed, the experiment uh, shows and quantitatively uh, supports um, our model predictions that the duration increase uh, and the duration decrease when the achieving speed and the there's a biphasic uh, dependence in the, of the run lines um, on the achieving speed. So taken together, we show that the FTSD treatment treatment drives the directed motility where a brain ratchet mechanism. So now, now let's um, switch gear and try to address the second question of how the FTSD treat mainly controls the SPG synthesis. And it is conserved, uh, well, it is conserved in many different bacteria that the FTSD treat mainly drives the directional motility for the essential SPG synthesis enzymes, but how the treatment controls the uh, septal cell wall synthesis plays out very differently in different cells. Uh, in E. coli, GSA experiment shows that the total amount of SPG synthesis is insensitive to uh, the FTSZ treat amine speed. In contrast, in synthesis, and the SPG synthesis sensitively depends on the treatment speed. So we will now try to leverage our model, try to explain this difference. And um, from GS experiment, we know that actually the FTSC bond SPG synthesis, such as FTSI or W, is inactive in the synthesis activities. This suggests that the lifetime of FTSC bond FTSI um, is actually inversely proportional to the enzyme activation rate, and hence, it will uh, inversely proportional to the SPG synthesis. Now the question uh, is, can we explain the life, how the lifetime of FTSC bond uh, FTSI is both sensitive and insensitive to the treatment speed when within the same branding ratchet model? So what we will do now is that when the measured uh, diffusion constant of FTSI in different bacteria, we can use our model to fit the FTS, uh, the uh, SPG synthesis curve when the single free parameter, the binding potential. And the fitted binding potential uh, is around eight to nine KBTs for E. coli and uh, 10 to 12 KBTs for uh, sub synthesis. So this brings up the question of why uh, that the different bacteria use different binding potentials. We speculate that it might be due to the different functional requirements for the septal cell wall synthesis. Well, the synthesis have a cell wall that that about uh, 10 times thicker than E. coli. The septal constriction rate and hence the SPG synthesis rate is comparable or even faster than E. coli. So consequently, the synthesis will need to uh, recruit more uh, SPG uh, enzymes to the septum, which will entail a, a higher binding potential for a higher septal uh, localizations. In contrast, it is estimated that the uh, in the E. coli, it's typically about like a ten, around 10 functional SPG synthesis complexes at the septum. From a theoretical perspective, this, this small number of complexes will uh, more likely render a non-uniform Mm, distribution of SPG synthesis activities along the septum due to the effect of the small number of fluctuations. And uh, indeed, from GS, uh, from GS experiments, it shows that the wild type FTSZ treatment speed at about 30 nanometers per second is actually required 
for a uniform distribution of SPG synthesis along the substrate. Decreasing this, uh, tri the tripping speed will increase the chance of incomplete uh, subtle constriction, where the, um, the SPG synthesis is unevenly uh, distributed along the, uh, the perimeters of the sample. Now the question is, how does the spatial mm, distribution of SPG synthesis depend on the FTSC treatment speed. To address this question, we'll extend our model by explicitly incorporating the effect of the process of the SPG uh, synthesis. Here is the schematics that summarize the GS2 track experiment and serves as the basis for uh, our model. Uh, when the SPG enzymes dissociate from the FTSZ, uh, it will get primed by binding to FTSN, and this primed complex will remain will, will remain stationary until being fully activated by the by the cell wall precursor the unlipid two. There, the fully activated um, uh, enzyme will drive uh, the precisive SPG synthesis by end on tracking the green end of SPG strain at an average speed of eight nanometer per second. Now to formulate this uh, picture into a um, mathematical model, we will extend our one dimensional model to two dimension. Now the simulation domains is a hundred nanometer by 3000 nanometer to mimic the dimensions of the septum in coli. Within this uh, simulation domains, there are many FTSD filaments in cluster that the treat males to the right, to the right or to the left uh, kind of random. And there are a few SPG synthesis enzymes that are represented by an, as the circular disk. As the enzyme attract the FTSD flow after a while, it will dissociate uh, from the Z track and become free diffusing. This free diffusing complex will rapidly uh, 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 convert it to a stationary uh, complex. This is a prime state that will gain the full activation of, FTS, uh, of the uh, SPG synthesis. The fully activated uh, enzyme will produce the SPG strain at the same time, it travels when it at the elongation rate of roughly about eight nanometer per second. All these reactions are reversible and we simulated um, stochastically uh, in the model. Now, when this new uh, model, here is the typical uh, simulation trajectory for a single SPG synthesis enzyme. Uh, we can now project the trajectories along the length of the, the septum to uh, discern the different motility states of the, uh, of the enzymes. And this model basically provides a framework that can meaningfully connect with our experiments. And by comparing the trajectories for our experiment when the model result, we now at a better position to dissect how the different motility states of the SPG synthesis enzymes interconvert when on each other. When that, uh, now let's go back to the question of how the FTSZ treat and mainly controls the spatial distribution of SPG uh, synthesis. And uh, here in our uh, model, we can, uh, we can calculate, we can, hmm? we can calculate why is the, Uh, we can calculate uh, the spatial profiles of newly synthesized SPG uh, along the septum. The, each line here uh, represents uh, the uh, newly synthesized SPG strings and different color are, uh, mark the different initiation time in the uh, synthesis. As you can see, the spatial mm, distribution is much more smoother at a faster uh, FTSC treatment speed. 
Now, if we bend the number of an SPG uh, strand along the length of the inception, we can get the um, uh, histogram um, from, uh, from which we can calculate the, uh, the coefficient of variation in the spatial profiles of SPG uh, synthesis. The model predicts that the, uh, the coefficient of, of, of variation decreases when the trading speed. The faster the, F, uh, and the trading speed, the smoother the FTSD uh, synthesis will, uh, will distribute it along the septum. This may explain why at, at slower FTSD trading speed, the SPG synthesis often non-uniformly distributed along the septum, compromising the uh, septal constructions. Jin, For the physical reason, Tian, sorry, we're going a little uh, over time. I just yeah. wanted to give you a time check. Sure. Um, so the physical uh, reason is that we can consider the uh, FTSD treat maybe as a train that will position the uh, SPG synthesis enzyme along the septum. So the uh, persistent relevance it's like the offloading distance between the train mm, stations. So it increases when the trading speed up to a limit as we have demonstrated. So once offload from the Z-track, the enzyme can synthesize the SPG in either direction uh, when equal probabilities. Now let's consider the SPG uh, synthesis is in the opposite direction of the Z-track. Now, at a uh, fast trading speed, the offloading mm, distance is long. So when the inactivated enzyme will, uh, is carried away by the Z-track, it, it can get react, reactivated further away. And consequently, the SPG synthesis will spread out. In contrast, uh, at, the, at the slow, uh, uh, at a slow trading speed, the offloading distance is short. So the SPG synthesis activity will more than likely cluster together than spread out. So therefore the model suggests that the um, FTSZ trading speed may be selected to maximize the persistent runlets so that the SPG synthesis can spread out evenly along the uh, septums. So to summarize, um, uh, we show that the uh, FTSD treatment mainly drives the directed mo uh, motility where a brand ratchet uh, mechanism. And we provide some evidence that the FTSD treatment speed controls the spatial mm, distribution of SPG synthesis along the septum by modulating the, uh, the persistent relevance of the enzymes. So in the future, we would like to address uh, many questions, for example, how does the FTSD treatment really controls the septal cell wall uh, synthesis and how the treatment and the cell wall synthesis work together in driving the cell division? And this all be in great collaboration with GS Lab. And uh, with that, I'd like to stop by thanking the people who are involved in this nice uh, project and all of our funding agencies. Um, thank you. Thank you very much to both of you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. At this time, we are going to go ahead and spotlight our additional experts for the open Q&A section. So I believe that that is Andrew and Elizabeth and Alexander. The floor is yours. All right, thank you. Uh... G and Gian for a really fascinating talk. Um, so perhaps uh, this this presentation is slightly distinguished from the one this morning because it seems like um, you're not necessarily looking for the right model, lo looking to us or anyone else for the right model. Um, it's it's almost like you might have it. <laughs> um, so I. I might ask my other panelists, I mean, I have several questions that are mostly like curiosities about 
the biology. They're more like why questions. Why does this work? Have you thought about this? But um, if, if the other panelists have any questions about like how this works or what yeah. part of the model, uh, how did you decide to model this or how does the model work? Maybe yeah, I might, there. maybe, yeah, if I can jump in, maybe I would start with the question. Yeah, I, I sort of had a, a question about can you give us sort of the historical background on this model? Because I agree with Andrew, it sort of seems like um, from a lot of the results you show, it seems like maybe you 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 have found a, a very appropriate modeling framework. It looks like it's been very successful. Um, and so I guess my question would be, you know, where did you start? Did, was this kind of a, a forward modeling project where you you really um, could sort of come in and, and build the model based on prior knowledge and, 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 and it seemed to kind of give you what you wanted or were there some... Um, uh, obstacles along the way where you had to kind of reframe, you know, it, it, what's, what's kind of the backstory <laughs> of how the process went. And Jade, do you want to start? Um, if you want to hear the backstory, I have to say that we were puzzled by this question for a long time, you know, how a trapped meaning polymer was stationary monomer in the cytoplasm, how that would be delivered to the paraplasm and drive the other enzymes at a single molecule level directionally moving. We really have no idea, but I think what's been fortunate is that at the time when we just published the work, Jane joined a uh, cell biology department at Hopkins from NIH, and I was, you know, I was part of his recruitment team, and we started chatting about this story, and he immediately got interested. I mean, at that beginning, it's just really casual conversation. I said, we saw this, we have no idea what's happening. Then I remember one day, Jen just walked into my office and said, hey, I think there might be a way to explain why you saw, must be some type of rhetoric mechanism. I mean, I, I really, I mean, I know that classic bronging ratchet mechanism like you know actin filament pushing membrane continues by adding monomers in front but so this is a little different I and mean, we have two ideas how to do then just start developing all those ideas how things could work and you know, what would be in play i have lost say, i don't recall any modeling effort before this for the whole phenomenon is that right jen um right um but yeah i think you are you you are you are too um uh, humble on this and and i think you provide one key observation that really uh got it started uh i i think you told me that the uh the how, the the speed of the treatment uh is not correlated when i mean it is correlated when the uh, GDP is activity. Mm -hmm. But if you put it back into the number, <clears throat> it is like, oh, um, mm -hmm. right. I, I mean, if you put that back into the number, actually uh, you calculate that. Um, the GDP, uh, the, the way that they utilize the energy is almost like a hundred times slower than yeah. Yeah. the That's motion of uh, the treatment speed. So that really means that, yes, there is active energy uh, involved from the a physical point of view, but this energy is not in the traditionally like a linear stepper motor protein that the tightly couples to the yeah, yeah, uh, right. motion. So that's really, to me, that's really the first impression that is really defined by the experimental observations. And um, from my point of view, I, I have been working on this uh, branding ratchet type of um, uh, uh, model since maybe 2014 uh, and, and onward. And I also get the training from uh, my uh, postdoc advisor, George Oster, and he's uh, uh, famous for this, the branding ratchet mm -hmm. mechanism Perfect. for the um, <laughs> for the set of skeletons right so i i, I consider myself a, a familiar with this concept um and but it's fortunate that that we collaborated when uh uh when GA, and then we finally uh work together really smoothly and to um nail down this mechanism altogether 
I, I really want to comment on one thing. I think that during this the development of the modeling, Jane and I really work the back and forth. We constantly talk to each other. And Jane would ask all sorts of questions, you know, detailed to all our experimental setup. What do you see this? Do you see that? It, it, you know, he would send me text message any time of the day, say he can call you or send me email, say, does this make sense? And we really work very closely with each other. I think without his attention, to those experimental details, other than just having a model trying to see if your experiment fits or not. He really look into our experimental details, then go back to his model trying to make sure that his model will be able to depict what we saw in experiment. I found that, you know, that attention to detail and really strictly adhere to what you can actually observe in experiment. I think that's really uh, that that's one very important factor in our collaboration. I really appreciate that. He asked all those very uh, deep questions because uh, the field is big. I mean, the field is back to 50 years. There's so many literature out there. He would start all those papers and come back and modify the model and ask all the details. So I think this very close interaction is really key to our collaboration. And uh, and also I would add on that that the GA is uh, is the one that really happy to answer all all this. I, I, I would say many of the question is really a naive question, and due to the my lack of background of the experiment, so and That's and she really have the patience that to carry me through through this process. Yes. You don't oh, have to mention maybe. that. I'm happy everyone <laughs> asks those questions. I can keep talking for hours. <laughs> okay, so in, in that spirit, I'm going to ask a really naive question. So you, you uh, showed that this uh, FTSI, like, you know, has these off onloading and onloading times yes. and offloading times. And the, the speed of the treadmill is, is important in setting, in sort of smoothing out the, right. uh, the onloading and offloading time. So my, my very naive question is, why why would it not be the treadmill itself or something attached to the treadmill which seems to be going quite ballistically that's you know why not just attach the thing to the treadmill and then you have whatever is is setting the the synthesis you know being very very smooth right so that's a why question that you might not know but i'm just curious no, no, Andrew, that's a very good question. We thought of that before, but one of my postdoc, Jason, provided an answer, which is that the treadmill speed is very fast, 30 nanometer per second. In E. coli, we don't have enough precursors or substrate to allow the synthesis to run at such a fast speed. The maximum speed we can go to, you know, we really max out everything, you know, very rich media, and after regulated to those essential enzymes to express those uh, uh, precursor synthesis enzymes, even at that maximum level, we can only go to about 12 to 15 nanometer per second, which is about 12 to 15 precursors per second. So it leads like two folds of difference. I think biochemically speaking, I think it would be hard to match up with that speed. So the that's a very you know uh, that's the that's, that's the constraint on the yeah that sets mm -hmm. a constraint on the synthesis but why yeah. what sets the constraint that the treadmilling has to be fast is mm -hmm. that constrained too? Mm -hmm. That's a good uh, question. Um, one, I mean, Jen and I actually talk about this um, um, uh, just uh, uh, recently. I, we think that the uh, the the, the septal constriction rate is actually coupled to other processes in the cell cycle. For example, that it had to wait until the chromosome segregate. And uh, overall, uh, the whole the cell kind of work as um, as in on the systems level. So and uh, yes, in theory, you could make the um, the treatment get faster and faster up to some limit. And in visual experiment, actually shows that um, uh, the fastest speed I, I think showed by uh, Martin Lewis will be like uh, 80 nanometer per in vitro, yeah. yeah, in vitro. Uh, so that means biochemically, it, it is possible. Uh, you put the speed up in vitro, but in vivo, um, this uh, uh, constriction process will, will couple to other process. 
So there is a higher level of constraint there. And I, I think that would be a very interesting question to pass out um, 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 on, on how exactly on the mechanistic uh, level different processes coupled uh, together. Okay, thank you. I, I have another question on something you didn't model, but I, I wanna see if Sasha or, or Elizabeth uh, have, wants to ask anything. Hi, uh, John, uh, very nice talk. I, I had a question since, again, kind of naive related to this, but you showed these plots, uh, E. coli versus B. subtilis, where you yes. had FTS, FTSZ treadmill on the x-axis, and the range there was like from five to 60 nanometers per second, right? It was a longer range, but now you're right. saying it's quite right. constrained, right. so. Right, right. So, so, uh -huh. so what? So, so it's not that large, that's like in, in vitro or that's in vivo or what's with, you know the plot I'm talking about. But yeah, 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 uh, let me just share the screen and then we have, yes, uh, you, and you talk about here, right? Yes, yeah, so you have oh, yeah. quite a range of treadmilling speeds. Right. So what determines right. what's happening here? Um, the, it, it's basically all, all these, uh, data point corresponding to uh, wild type and uh, also the GTPS um, point mutation in E. coli. For but subtilis system, uh, really the, if I do the annotation, uh, if I do the annotation here, uh, all these will be uh, uh, the GTPS activities, uh, the point, mutation. At this point, as I recall, uh, it actually is another inhibitor for uh, FTSZ treatment that if you do the mutation on that, that, that will uh, increase the overall treatment speed in subtilis. But the, the two bacteria uh, have, may have different regulation of the treatment speed. I see. So, so, so on the x-axis, you have different mutants, but the variability within e, for each particular mutant is shown sort of on the y-axis by the error bars. Is that right? Right. And it seems to be much smaller for E. coli than B. What you call it? Yes. Right. So I was just wondering why the variability seems to be so much less for E. coli. I, I, I see. You you are asking the on the y-axis. Um, for that, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, Those are I, I'm, completely yeah. different measurements. Sasha, if I can jump in. We did the measurements using a incorporation of cell wall precursor that labeled was a dye. And in Bacillus, they did the measurement by the arriving time of a protein that marking the completion of the constriction. So those are very different measurements. So I don't know if you can really compare that error, but one is by time and one is by fluorescence intensity. And also, I think over there um, in Bacillus, I believe this is the data, the distribution of the data. And in ours, it's the standard error of the mean. Thank you. Yeah, yeah and, I, and I also had, um, I guess, another sort of naive question. So you had this nice uh, Brownian ratchet model where you have the driving force and you have the random thermal force. And so the diffusion coefficient appears in KBT over D, right, in the lambda. Right. Right. But, but you were talking about switching between fast and slow diffusion. So I didn't quite oh. catch. Oh, 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 oh. It's not a switching between fast and slow diffusion. It is, a, you talk about a two-track model. Yes. Right. Uh, the, um, uh, in the two-track model, the, on the Z-track, uh, the, the, the feature is exactly the same as one-dimensional uh, model. The only difference is that now the uh, FTSI could have another state that could end track the SPG synthesis um, therefore, it's kind of like add on the add on tracking of the green, the green end of the uh, synthesis, uh, SPG synthesis strain. So that is a slow directional motion uh, at eight nanometer per, uh, per second. If I can, if I, I, I explain that. Uh, 
And I am really sorry to interrupt, but after this, we might need to wrap experts unless you have, okay. So I, I actually have one question, if that's possible, Donalyn. Very short question, Dave. Yes. Can I go now? Yes. I don't want to interrupt. Well, I, I was very fascinated by Andrew's question because it did seem to me, I, I saw Jan, I saw you talk at UIC once and when you started discussing this model, it seemed reminiscent of work you've done before. And so I think the big question here is um, when you choose a way to model something, I think that's a big question on many people's minds. And it seemed like you just happened to be the right fit. It was like a boy meets girl, perfect moment here. Is, is right. that right? I mean, you just happened to have the right background and the right model in your back pocket when you walked into her office. Right, right. Or were there um, other approaches that could have been used? Right. Uh, I tell you what, that, that, that um, uh, partially yes is by chance. But on the other hand, I, I have to say that I, uh, I have paid attention to this field for a long time. And uh, in my free time, I always like to read uh, on many topics. So FTSZ is a fascinating, it's a fascinating uh, molecule. It's been in the field for a long time. It's so um, uh, classic. So I like biology, so I, I read a lot. So I take notes of the, uh, the recent progress in that field. So I would say I kind of prepared in that sense, not fully prepared uh, until I talk with Jie, I, I realized there are so many things that, that I read on the paper are different uh, from, an, uh, from the real experimental uh, uh, per, uh, perspective. But I, I, I would say that you know, um, as a modeler, perhaps um, how you know how they say this? Um, as a modeler, you got to kind of broaden your uh, your uh, knowledge in biology, and and I think that's is important. Uh, whether the specific topic can be um, can be really prepared to a fine tune uh, into a project that I don't know, but the more you read, the more chance you will uh, uh, find the right collaboration. And I, I, in this case, um, I'm very uh, grateful to uh, have Jie as my collaborator. Thanks. Yeah. With that, Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank, Thank you, you so much for your presentation. Um, Jocelyn has a few closing comments for us, and then we're going to move into our concurrent session. But thank you for a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much, Donalyn. Um, so a couple things. Um, the first one is a huge, huge thank you for an amazing day. There was a lot of information shared today. There were a lot of questions and just some really robust conversation. So we want to thank um, all of the presenters for their time from the start of the morning with our lightning talks all the way until the project presentations and now our continuous um, uh, highlight uh, will be with our concurrent sessions. So a couple of things about our concurrent sessions. The first thing is that they meet the modeler session. That will happen right here. For those that have signed up for those sessions, please stay in this space. You do not need to go anywhere. Um, the second piece is for our concurrent sessions, you will find on KaiStorm, and I will share screen in a second, um, that you, uh, you will find there a, a Zoom button at the very top of each of those present uh, concurrent sessions. So if you see here, if you go to concurrent session uh, workshop one, introduction to computational approaches, you will see at the very top, there's a join Zoom button there. And if you've signed up for the other on um, how to talk to biologists, there is another join Zoom button at the very top there. Um, so these presentations will take place outside of the main plenary. 
And again, our Meet the Modeler sessions will take place here. Now, a couple of things that I'd like to share um, about tomorrow. So this is our soft closing. Uh, tomorrow, we will pick back up with our lightning talks. Um, so please be sure to uh, join us for that at 9 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, and after the concurrent sessions today, we do have our Wonder Room, our networking lounge open. So feel free to continue to connect with colleagues after uh, the sessions today. Um, I think that's about it. Donalyn, am I leaving anything out? The only addition that I would have is um, you have a designated time for your meet a modeler. So maybe try to be in this room a couple minutes ahead of time. Um, just so that we can make sure and check you in. That would be awesome. But otherwise, I think that was it. Thanks, Jocelyn. I'm looking forward to later <laughs> presentations tomorrow too. Yes, wonderful. So thank you all. Uh, please enjoy the next couple of uh, sessions and uh, we will see you tomorrow morning because we will not return to the space. Meet the modelers, please stay in this space. Okay, so enjoy your sessions and we'll see you in the morning.